Christianity. We're talking about uh, the the core beliefs of our church, our statement of faith, and how the mind blowingness, the complexity of the Trinity, and the implications for us as a church. How. Uh, the need for community is not just something that is nice to add to life, but how it is at the center of how life was created. It is also about how we lay down our individual needs and desires to help glorify and serve one another, because that is what God has done and is doing in the three persons of the Trinity. Now, I don't have the verses on the screen. We're going to be, we're also going to be in Mark. I know uh, Philly was in Mark this morning. He was in chapter 3. We're going to be in chapter 2 first, and then we're going to go to chapter 4. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles. But before we get to that, I, I prayed this morning, God, you lead, I'll follow. Help me to get out of the way of your message. Just speak whatever it is you know i i have my notes and everything but there's something that i thought i needed to talk about and that was the baptism of jesus now i think that is uh found in matthew 3 but i don't have that on the screen what we have at the baptism of jesus is the father speaks the spirit descends like a dove above the waters, and then you have Jesus in the water. Now, I've read I've, this past week. I spent a lot of time reading. I spent a lot of time listening to different things, as I usually do. Uh, but there was something that stuck out to me and something that I heard that how that picture right there, Father God speaking, Spirit hovering, and then you have a man. This is a picture of creation. In Genesis 1, it says that God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit hovered above the waters. And how all the Old Testament is leading up to Christ's life. And how God had been painting this story from the very beginning. And we get to celebrate it every year at Christmas. The, the coming of our Messiah, the coming of Christ. Just don't get too caught up in the pressure of a holiday. When this holiday represents something so magnificent. The baptism of Jesus, this picture of recreation. That new life starts whenever we accept Christ, when we are baptized into his life. Because the Father spoke, the Spirit hovered, and there was a new man, Christ. And that is our, our core problem, is that we do not understand life. If you want to take notes, that's our first point. We don't understand life. All the movies, you know, I, I think it's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The meaning of life. The number 42. And it's like, no, that's definitely not right. You know, 42. The, the real meaning of life is found in the Trinity. And that's what we looked at last week. And so, Christ came. To give us life. To show us life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 1 says, the word was with God and the word was God. And all that was created was through him and by him. And nothing has life except through the word. And the word was Christ. So we don't understand life if we don't understand Christ. We care too much about the wrong things, and we care too little about the important things. Man, 
we are deceived. We are lost. Just like Amazing Grace or sometimes framed in broken vessels. We were lost. And now we are found. But it is only through looking at the life of Christ. And as a church, we are going to pattern our lives after Christ. We're all going to quit our jobs and we're going to roam around for three years <laughs> at least until someone kills us. No. But what is important to Christ? That is what should be important to us. There's a lot of things that we have to get done in a week. There's a lot of things that we feel like we have to do. We have to, you know, and, it, and people get in the way of that, don't they? Billy's uh, communion meditation, that, that's about, that about sums it up, right? We get angry about sauce and fish sandwiches. We get angry when the car in front of us isn't going fast enough or doesn't use their turn signal or, you know, has to slow down because there's a deer. We get angry whenever, we don't necessarily get angry, but does anybody else see someone in Walmart that they don't necessarily want to talk to and head the other direction? <laughs> because you're like, I gotta get my grocery shopping done. Is that the way of Christ? People are the most important thing, second to God himself. The Pharisees said, what's the greatest law? And Christ said, love your God with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor as yourself. To celebrate the, the wins. Whenever someone else wins in life, you should celebrate it as if you won. Whenever someone else gets that promotion that you wanted, we should celebrate. That is what Christ is saying. Love your neighbor as yourself. And whenever your neighbor mourns, your friend mourns, your someone else is going through something, do you treat that person with the same care and love that you would want to be treated with? How much does your life look like Christ? How much are you caring about the wrong things? And how little are you caring about what is really important? What do you want in life? Let's take a look at this list. I would say most of you want most, if not all, of these things. A happy marriage, a rewarding career, whether that's outside the home or inside the home. Great kids, a social life, confidence. Huh? Anybody want some confidence? Money, health, and fun. If you had this whole list, you'd probably say, that's the life I want. You know, you throw like a big house in there. You throw like, if something new comes out, you've already got it. All that stuff. That's what you really want in life, right? This is your wish list. What do you define as your goal with money? I put it in your handout today. You can continue the sermon throughout the week if you want. In the notes section, there's define the win for each of those things, each of these things. For you, what does it look like to win with money? Is it just to have enough? More than enough? How do you know if you are on track for having great kids? Do you know what confidence feels like? What real confidence looks like? How do you find, how do you define what you want in life? And would God's perspective be a reality check on those things? The last question in your handout is Google. What does the Bible say about blank? 
and then reflect and say, does this line up with what I put? Now, I don't want, I'm not going to, I'm not going to require you to turn in your, your answers. I'm not going to like next week, drop in the box so I can double check. <laughs> so just be as real as you possibly can be. This is between you and God and for you to see, do you care too little about what is really important? Or do you obsess over the minor things in life? Now in Mark chapter 2, Jesus is doing several things. But at one point, we all know this story. A paralytic man gets lowered before Jesus. They, his friends clear out the thatch of the roof and they, they lower him down. And what does Jesus say whenever this man drops down in front of him? If you don't have your Bibles, he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Paralytic man, laying on a mat, his four friends lowered him down. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Would you feel robbed? You thought you were going to walk. And all this guy had the audacity to say was, your sins are forgiven. Is that enough? Is that what would make you happy? Really? I mean, honestly, I'll tell you what. Me, laying there on a mat, I would be like, dang it. I was really hoping for some healing. But think about it. If this man got up and walked, do you think he would ever get sad again? Do you think at some point walking would just be normal and he would no longer appreciate what he really has? I heard a really, really rich person say, you know, he was a comic. And he, he you know, had to work him so hard, working, working his tail off, trying to figure out like how to break into the comedy scene. And then finally he made his big break and he made tons of money. And he got this apartment and it was like just a massive apartment. Had a loft, was super cool. And he, every time he came home, he'd walk in the door and he'd just be in disbelief. That this is really my place. He was renting it. But, you know, this is my home. And then eventually, he got a bigger place, and he got a bigger place, and he got his own house. And he said, but it wasn't very long before I started going into that apartment. It's just normal. It's just like, this is the place I live. This is just a house. This is just home. It was no longer like, wow, look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I have. Look at what, what I've finally done with my life. Because it just became normal. And so continuing the story, and immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they, the Pharisees, thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Now they're saying, who does this, who, this man has the authority to forgive sins? Who does he think he is? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic. I say to you, rise, and pick up your bed, and go home. I would say, eventually, that paralytic man just got used to walking. He probably didn't thank God every step he had. Because we don't thank God every step we have. I'd say eventually this man was disappointed in life. And because we don't hear about any 2,000 year old people who used to be paralytics, he eventually died as well. Now, which one do you think he is truly appreciative of at this point? Do you think he said, ah, he forgave my sins, but he let me walk for 30 years. Or do you think he's saying, 
Jesus forgave my sins. And now I get to spend eternity with him. Which one do you think he appreciates more now? Which one are you going to appreciate? The things that you've been given, the gifts that you received this year, or Christ? There's a movie that came out recently. Uh, the name is Disenchanted. And we, Bethany had turned it on. We were working on the house. We were eating supper. And then Mariah and I got back to work. And, and I was thinking about this movie, Disenchanted. And I won't spoil too much. I'll just say probably what would, would read in the headline of it. Uh, the main character gets their wish granted. And slowly turns into something that they hate. I kept thinking, man, there's got to be something about disenchanted. Why would they name it disenchanted? And so I looked up the definition of disenchanted. And it is to be disappointed by something you once respected or admired. This main character thought, if I could only have life like this everything would be wonderful everything would just be just perfect and then she was given it and then she turned into something that she hated and she spent the rest of the movie trying to reverse it where are you disenchanted i know a lot of people who get disenchanted by church I am not perfect. This church is not perfect. This place is just a place full of sinners. And I, I hate that pastors get caught up in sin. Especially the, you know, the, the huge pastors. And it seems like it's just sexual immorality, sexual immorality, sexual immorality. Can't say that five times fast. Mm -hmm. And then there's you know, the random guy who buys a jet with church funds. And we think, man, Christianity, I once really respected it. And now I just realize that, you know, it's not really what they claim it to be. But whenever you look at Christ, the only time you get disenchanted is whenever you think Christ should revolve around you. Whenever Christianity is for your benefit alone. And we're not going to be a me-centered church. But let's say, you know what, Josh? I'm not a me-centered Christian. Being a Christian is about following God. And that's what I do. I just wish that I didn't have to suffer so much. I wish that... All, if, if it wasn't for all the things that I've been through in my life, if it wasn't for the things that, I, that I'm dealing with, then life would be great. And I don't understand why God isn't taking these things away. There's a, another situation that Jesus encounters, and he handles it totally different than I would think. And that's two chapters later in Mark 4. Let's go there. Mark 4, 37 through 41. <clears throat> Now, remember, Jesus' disciples are primarily, like, the, the overwhelming, uh, the most occurring profession of the disciples is to be fishermen, right? They're, they used to be fishermen. And Jesus said, let's get out on the boat. And so you've got Andrew, John, James, Peter, maybe others. I, there might have been another fisherman. So you've got four out of the twelve are fishermen used to handling a boat, used to just dealing with all sorts of situations on the water. But the Bible says, and a great windstorm arose, and the wind and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. This is like everybody's panicking. Even the people who are familiar with the ship, 
they're panicking. Everybody's panicking because we're going to drown. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Now, what in your life is like the ship is breaking? Where is the storm in your life? And are you saying, God, why are you sleeping on the job? Your job is to handle when things go bad. What else could you be doing right now? Well, maybe you just sleep. But then Jesus says, or sorry, but then, and they woke him. There we go. Second part of 38. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? God, do you not care what I'm going through? Can you not see what I'm dealing with? Verse 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And that's what we all want, right? We want there to be calm. We want there to be peace. And we want that to be the end of the story. When the sun shows up, everything's great. But verse 40 says, He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Now, they were scared before, and then they were scared afterwards, right? And you're like, how does that make any sense? Because they came to the realization that the storms are bad. The storms have power. That the storms have a control that is outside of their ability to control. But more powerful than that is Christ. The power that Christ has, you have no chance of control. Christ could say, be gone. And the whole world could just be gone. Power over nature. Power over creation. Do you know what that means? Power over everything that you experience is within the power of Christ. And do you feel like God's just sleeping through your storm and he doesn't care? There have been times where I thought, God, why in the world would you let this happen? And I didn't come through the window of God because I didn't know where it was. But I wanted to go into God's house and I wanted to tear some things up. Not the church. <laughs> but God was just there. Relaxing. He said, you know, I got this. This is not an opportunity for you to panic. This is an opportunity to show your faith. And I'm not going to say, you know, that. Oh, it's just that you don't have enough faith. That is a, that is a, that's kind of a blow off statement. But, God is allowing things for a reason. And we don't understand why yet. We don't understand how yet. But God will use this. Just don't underestimate Christ's love for you. Don't underestimate Christ's saving and redeeming power in your life. Our second point. Your main problem isn't the suffering you have or will experience. It's how you handle it. This is why the disciples were rebuked. Because how they handled the storm.
we misunderstand how much God cares about us. Now, I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not against animals. Man, sometimes they really grow on me. But I'm kind of ambivalent. I'm apathetic towards the, the plight of animals sometimes. But I walked into my parents' garage. And there was a little blue bird. And it's flapping and it's hitting the window, you know. And so what do I do? I open up the garage doors and I grab a broom and I try to herd this bird out the garage doors. But of course, you know, it flies over the garage doors. It, it just keeps going back to that window. And think about what this bird is pictured or is going through in his mind, right? It's flapping away. You know, I thought about putting a picture of me as the blue bird from BBS. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to be there. So, he's flapping his wings. He keeps hitting this window. He keeps hitting this window. And then all of a sudden, it's like, I can see what I want. I can see where I want to be. But for some reason, I can't get there. And now, there's this huge thing chasing me with a broom. <laughs> This is the worst day of my life. Things can't get much worse. I'm just glad this guy has really bad aim. <laughs> but the events, in reality, are much different. The guy with the broom wasn't actually trying to hit the bird. He's just trying to show the bird which way to go. But that bird is now traumatized by brooms. <laughs> The worst experience of that bird's life, maybe. You know, there could have been worse. It could, I don't know what it flew to afterwards and I don't know what it had been through, but that would be traumatic. From God's perspective, are you being chased by a broom? Are there wide open doors waiting for you to go through? waiting for you to just slip on by. But do you keep on going to a window that you're never going to get through? Do you keep returning to thoughts that never get you anywhere? Do you keep returning to relationships that are dead ends? Do you keep banging your head up against the wall and thinking, God, just tear this wall down. Whenever there's a door right down the corner. Whenever there's a wide open space where God's shepherding you to, is there a different way of doing life? How are you failing to recognize the life of Jesus, the way of Jesus, the truth of Jesus in your life? This was what Jesus came for. Our last point today. Jesus came to save us from ourselves. We are our own worst enemies. We don't recognize how dead in sin we really are. How there is nothing good in us. How there is no reason in us that goes towards the truth. Jesus' second to last words. Luke 23, 34 says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You don't know. Christ is saying, what you don't know can hurt you. What you don't realize can hurt you. It doesn't matter how many people you have around you, if none of them know what they're doing. My brother, I talked to my brother this past week, and, or no, I, I showed back up. I, I had left the poor to come here and do some things, and then was going back to double check on them, make sure they were good. And there's four guys doing plumbing. And none of them are plumbers. 
Now, I'm not saying they did a bad job. I don't know, I, I wasn't there. I don't think we've turned the water on yet, so. But I would much rather have one person who really knows what they're doing than a hundred guys who don't know what they're doing, right? You would much rather have <clears throat> Billy work on some electrical than a hundred Joshes. <laughs> You'd end up with a bunch of dead Joshes. <laughs> Honestly. You would not want a hundred Joshes singing. You'd much rather have one Mariah. I know. It's just... <laughs> one man came. One man came who knew what life was really about. Jesus Christ. You would much rather have one Jesus Christ than a hundred people telling you what to do. Because what we don't know can hurt. The object of our present and future happiness can't be anything other than Christ. The only thing, and I know like, oh, well, the churchy word for happiness is joy. And so, and, and, and happiness connotes that, you know, the situations are, are, the circumstances in your life are good and they're making you happy. But joy is, is the Christian virtue, right? Joy in all circumstances. No, I say happy. You can be happy. Because the circumstance that you need to be happy is the forgiveness of sins. It isn't being able to walk. It isn't having the career that you want. It isn't having a certain amount of money. It isn't how well your relationships are doing. <clears throat> it is that Jesus has said, your sins are forgiven. And as a church, we're going to sin. As the body of Christ, we're going to do things wrong. We're going to get it wrong sometimes. But our sins are forgiven. And so as a church, what is mostly important is that we continue to lay aside our definitions of success. We lay aside what we think we need to be happy. And we adopt and pattern our lives after Christ. Because I guarantee you that God was happy. And I know right now that in the dance of God that we talked about last week, as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit lay down the center of their lives to each other, that they are happy. And if you want to read a book, I know, if you want to be happy, you don't want to read a book. <laughs> Desiring God by John Piper is a wonderful book on Christian happiness. But we need to support and encourage one another. Because there's going to be times where I am blind. Where I am so self-deceived that I am running into a window repeatedly. And I'm thinking God's chasing me with a broom. We need one another to say, you know, what if God's doing this in your life? Or you don't have any answers at all. But you just remind me that, Josh, I know this circumstance is not what you want. But whenever you die, these sufferings will not compare to the glory and richness that you have in heaven. And so keep fighting. Keep fighting. We need one another. Because otherwise we'll just play a victim to the life that God has given us. All that you have in your life is from God.
do you feel like a victim? Because the Bible says we are more than conquerors. 2 Corinthians says, I think it's in chapter 1, Paul's talking about an experience where him and, and his fellows were to the point that they despaired for their lives. That they said, God, I would rather be dead. And Paul said, we could not have made it on our own. But we came to the point that we realized that God was teaching us total dependence upon him. That we can't get through our lives on our own. That we need God. We all need God. And so if you don't have that relationship with Christ today, there is no reason to wait. There is no reason to put it off another day. Because our days are not promised. If you want that relationship with God, if you want to turn your life over to Him, and finally have real life, today's the day. Let's stand. Pray with me. Father God, we we get ourselves into a lot of messes. And God, this world is a mess. And there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of things that we would rather go without, do without. God, we put our trust in you to reshape our lives, to handle the things that we can't handle, to deal with the things that we can't deal with, and we lay it all at your feet. And God, if we have to continue going through it, by your glory and your strength, we will. God, help us to persevere. Not alone, but help us to persevere together. Help us to be the church that follows Christ. The church that looks like Christ. A church that is married to the idea and to the lifestyle of Christ. Every day, every morning, we hand it over to you. God, if there is anyone here today that wants to hand over their life for the first time to you, I pray that you will give them the courage to come speak with me. I thank you for all the work that you're doing in our lives. I thank you for the work that you're doing through our church. In Jesus' name, I